What's going on, Dodgers Nation? Doug McCain here, and it's a special day here at Dodgers Nation because I'm joined by the legend Ron Say. Thanks for joining us, Ron. How are you feeling today, my man? Doug, I'm doing morale. Thank you. Look, the, the word legend is thrown out too easily these days, but we've got a six-time All-Star, a World Series MVP, a World Series champion, and first thing we're going to do here is we're going to do some rapid-fire questions. This is a segment that I'm calling Say When. So <laughs> if you don't want to answer one of these questions, just say when and we'll go to the next one, but I think you'll do just fine. You ready? I'm ready. All right, first question. Favorite player growing up? Willie Mays. The strangest item you've ever been asked to autograph or sign? Say when. Who was the toughest pitcher that you faced and what made him so difficult to hit? Uh, it's about style, and it was Kent Ticaldi, the submariner. Favorite current player to watch? Wow, there's a lot of them. Um... I don't know if I can do it, but, you know, uh, oh, let's go with Otani. Did you have any superstitions? If so, what were they? Um, I think it was more of a, uh, a routine. Uh, I like to put it better that way. Uh, just a certain way that you, you know, went to the on-deck circle, the way that you approached the plate. Um, I had a, a, a thing that I would do when I first went up to home plate, which is uh, I'd, I'd address the catcher. And the umpire, and then it was, you know, pretty much uh, no more comments the rest of the day, unless I got upset with a pitch. <laughs> Who is the greatest baseball player of all time in your mind? That's kind of unfair, too. I didn't get a chance to see some of the greatest ones. Of course, uh, War will have Babe Ruth ranked as number one, Barry yeah. Bonds number two. I think Willie Mays was number three, uh, and the the you know, Henry Aaron and Willie Mays, I, I kind of have to put them in the same boat. Uh, I've got to give Henry that uh, simply because I was a part of so many things that uh, were a part of history. And the most legendary game I ever played in was the game that Henry Aaron broke Babe Ruth's home run record. So that was awesome. What was your favorite ballpark to play in that wasn't Dodger Stadium or Wrigley Field? Cincinnati because of the rivalry now last one here if you had to pick one of your former dodgers teammates to be stuck on a desert island with who would it be and why not any one of them none of them <laughs> none of them <laughs> okay so yeah he passed i had enough of all of them plus me <laughs> great great so uh, let's get into some 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 different questions now so the first thing we want to start off with is we have to start off with the legendary iconic nickname the penguin um you know i uh was uh coined the nickname uh, when I was at Washington State University. My uh, baseball coach there named Chuck Brayton um, knew that I had a uh, nickname from high school, which is Scooter, and uh, he just thought it was more like a penguin. And then, of course, I signed in 1968, and then uh, in the spring of 1969, I ran into Tom Lasorda, who I knew a great deal about, uh, because I was hanging around with uh, Bill Buckner's brother, Bobby, and Bill played for Tommy in, uh, in uh, the Rookie League in uh, Ogden, Utah. And uh, Lasorda, of course, uh, started calling me the Penguin and started taking credit for it. And I kept telling him that you're not the originator. Stop taking credit for it. <laughs> But he did, and so it stuck, and it was great. The fans, the kids loved it. Uh, they still call me the Penguin. So there you go. The record has been set straight. It was Chuck Brayton who originally yes. gave you the nickname, but Lasorda kind of popularized it, I'm assuming, kind of going with it. Tommy took credit for a lot of things that were. <laughs> yeah, I can totally see that. Yeah, so yeah, I want to talk about some of your early days with Tommy Lasorda in that 1968 draft class. It's considered to be the greatest draft class in baseball history. Such a storied group of guys. The Dodgers, they signed a total of 11 future big leaguers. You had Buckner, Garvey, Lopes, Alexander, Say. What was it like to be a part of that group? And just what do you remember from those guys? Well, uh, as you saw, it uh, uh, represented, you know, a pretty good nucleus of the team for so many years. Um, the... Uh, the fact that we, you know, are proclaimed uh, this is the gold standard, um, I actually have the highest war of any of those people during my career. And as a, as a footnote, I also have the highest war of anybody who was drafted in 1968. So uh, that surprised me. I just found that out here recently. So go. I'm very proud of that. But more importantly is that we were basically the 
the foundation of the Dodgers success, our history and tradition was written all over the walls in, in spring training in Vero Beach. So it was easy for us to uh, take that in. And I remember speaking with Peter O'Malley uh, years ago saying I got the message and he said, what message was that? And I said, the subliminal one where you walk through the halls of Dodger, St- uh, Dodger uh, town and you see the pictures of the great teams and the great players. And of course, I wanted to be one of those and I wanted our teams up there. So it did happen, but uh, it was, it, it, they didn't have to say too much. It was right in front of you every single day. Next, what I ask you about is some of the impactful lessons you had playing at the minor league level with some of those guys. And you guys were able to build a chemistry that translated into being the most successful infield in baseball history. And you played with Tommy Lasorda. There's a story that Tommy Lasorda would have his players send letters to the big leaguers that held their position. And you would write to them and say that you were going to take their position. Is there any truth to that story? Did you ever write one of those letters i did not uh (laughs) but i'm sure tommy probably did uh we had a great relationship from the beginning uh i thought his uh uh, most admirable uh most qualified uh uh, thing that he gave back to baseball was that he had a tremendous uh, eye for talent uh that was his contribution and he surrounded himself with the nucleus of players uh, that were going to be Dodgers and otherwise. Um, you know, that list that you have in 1968, you know, Doyle Alexander played a little bit with us, but he ended up playing 15 or 17 years in the major leagues. Um, you know, Joe Ferguson was with us for a while. Buckner was with us for a while. Didn't actually play too much for us. But, you know, here's another uh, a terrific player that, you know, spent 15 to 17 years. we got a ton of those guys in there. Uh, it was an honor uh, to be able to go out there and uh, basically create our own history and tradition that was set before us. You know, so we followed it up, and it was it was such a, uh, a wonderful thing to be involved with. And you know, we had the first thirty home run for us in Major League history. We had the infield that lasted eight and a half years, the most enduring and most successful by fact infield in major league history i'm not going to tell you that it was the best because uh there was a team or could have been a team that uh, played a year or two together that would have been uh, maybe the best team but not for eight and a half years there's nothing even close to it so the fact that we were able to do that when we had four world champions uh world series uh teams we had a world championship we had every member of the Fabled infield of the multiple time All Star, uh, the 1981 club. There, every team, every player on our team, uh, with the exception of one, uh, Steve Yeager, sorry, Steve, uh, was an All Star uh, during their career. So uh, we had Cy Young Award winners, we had Rookies of the Year, we had MVPs, we had World Series MVPs, we had it all. And we really had a great group of guys that understood the challenges and the responsibilities of representing Los Angeles Dodgers and our fan base. Yeah, and I think you just brought up, you had that core that went to four World Series. You won a World Series title. Lots of all-stars within that group. Well, I just want to tie this into the current Dodgers, Mm -hmm. Dodgers president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman. He's hinted at a youth movement for next season. Maybe you do have Gavin Lux playing shortstop. Maybe you do give guys like Michael Bush and Miguel Vargas an opportunity to play some of these infield spots. Do you think the Dodgers would benefit from trusting some of their younger talent instead of going outside and signing big name players and letting them grow like you guys did. We were homegrown. Uh, every member of that infield was a, uh, a signed uh, Dodger and minor leaguer. Um, we had an opportunity to work together. So we bonded uh, through instructional league and minor league baseball. We knew the guys uh, were responsible, dedicated. Uh, we didn't have to worry about somebody else showing up being here on time, going through the routine. Uh, It was very, uh, I think, soothing to Walter Alston and Tom Lasorda uh, to have a group that could basically be the foundation of your team every single day. Uh, The metrics has changed things. uh, And, you know, uh, I'm not surprised that the Dodgers are trying to move back because the farm system over the years has a deep history. But when you sign Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts and uh, in particular, you know, the, these two players are going to be there. There's not going to be any room for a minor leaguer to fill into that spot. So 
one of the things that the Dodgers did while I was playing uh, was they wanted uh, versatility. So they they uh, they wanted guys to try different positions to see if there would be multiple places that they could play. And I remember playing a little bit at second base. I played a game in left field, uh, which was a mistake because the uh, it was in instructional league and there. Uh, they they had guys pinned in to do, you know, I was going to play a game at third and then I'm going to take a day or take a whatever and play another position. And they said, hey, we've got an opening. One of our guys is sick. You want to just go play left field today? And I said, sure, why not? You know, get some at-bats and whatever. So early in the game, a guy hits the ball down the left field line. I go over, I cut it off. I throw one hopper to second base and I throw the guy out. Bad decision. You know, I should have airmailed it some way. Yeah. Uh, but th the problem was that... <laughs> By throwing this guy out, they really thought I might be able to play left field, and I couldn't play left field. Third base was my deal. I remember telling Monty Basgall, I said, Monty, I said, if I can't play third base every day here, you can put me wherever you want to. Yeah, so just find a way on the diamond any way you can. A little fake it to you, make it in left field. Yeah, we know that <laughs> they definitely cover that positional versatility. I want to ask you a couple more questions about Tommy Lasorda. So he said about you, Ron is perhaps the most disciplined hitter I've ever seen. He has great knowledge of the strike zone, seldom swings at a bad pitch, will take a walk. That's what makes him an outstanding power hitter. Now, what was it like to play for Tommy Lasorda, and how big of an impact did he have on your career? Well, he had a big impact on our career. Uh, you know, he started with, once again, the nucleus of those players at the time that they signed. And he was able to nurture them. You know, we spent basically four years with him. Uh, instructional leagues, spring training, minor leagues, you know, the exhibition games that we would play in. Uh, you know, he, he would work us. He was fighting for us. He threw tons of batting practice to us. He hits thousands of ground balls. Uh, we were his guys. And, you know, he needed us as much as we needed him. And it was a perfect fit because when we all graduated to the major leagues, he got to be the third base coach. And then four years later, he is uh, managing the club. Walt steps down. And then we, uh, we present him with a back-to-back -back World Series in his first two years. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely paid off. And I was going to ask you, do you think you could picture him managing in today's game? No, no? not at all. No, the metrics, uh, he, he wouldn't, he's not, he would not uh, have, uh, he's an old school guy. Yeah. Uh, you see Dusty Baker, uh, who's an old school guy. Um, there are not too many of those managers now that have the ability to uh, run the club. It's, it's, it's run from upstairs. The, the, the lineups are made up. Um, they have some input to it, but it's pretty much run by the metrics and all the people who put those numbers together. But I do think once you say that lighting a fire under your team, that translates in any era that some teams could benefit from his fire and passion. I think maybe he could he could figure out the modern game. He was such a great baseball mind. But I uh, want to ask you another question about Tommy Lasorda. So as you said earlier, when he took over as manager in 1977, he said that you guys would win the division. Now, prior to the last season, Dave Roberts said to put it on record, the Dodgers would go on to win the World Series. Does that have any added pressure? Does that impact you in any way out there on the field since i came to the dodgers way back when we always had a bullseye on our forehead oh, yeah. for many different reasons okay because we were a class organization uh you know you look at the success that the dodgers had in brooklyn uh coming to la uh you know they win a world championship 59 they win three more they're in three more world series in the 60s and then it kind of turns over to our era so there's another three world series in uh that 10-year period and then two in the 80s and then we all of a sudden you know went you know see you later i don't know where it went but you know not until here recently so it was 30 years went by uh our history and tradition suffered but, uh, you know, we made a hu huge impact, and Tommy was a, a, a very big part of that. But, you know, these guys, I don't think he'd have to be a motivator. These guys celebrate everything, you know. Uh, it's a celebratory game now, and uh, it's much different than the one we played because people were worried about, you know, getting embarrassed or, you know, showing somebody up, and we respected that, and we celebrated pretty much after the game. But now it seems to be pretty much party all day long. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And when you look at that, the fact that there is always a bullseye on the Dodgers, Max Muncy told us last week, he calls it the Dodger effect. When the fastball is a couple of velocity takes higher, team just want to beat L.A. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And I, you know, it. we had, a, 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 you know, another stamp on the on the bullseye because of the Dodger plane that we had. We were the only team that had our own private plane, KO2. Right. Uh, everybody else is flying commercial, and uh, I'm sure that irritated a lot of people after a Sunday day game here at Dodger Stadium. We're going to the airport, and we're leaving when we get ready to leave, and these people have a charter plane leaving at 9 o'clock, and we're already halfway to New York before they've got their seat buckles on. So it, it's, it, you know, that was hung over our head a little bit. Uh, Al Campanis used to say that. He said there's a lot of guys who want to fly in that plane. Yeah, Dodgers yeah. rolling in style, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, no, I definitely, definitely agree with that. Now, I want to ask you about Dusty Baker. So he, of course, was a member of that 30 home run quartet. And we know that you guys already took care of business before the last game of the season. He, of course, needed another home run. And it was game 162. Now, I heard a story about Reggie Smith calling over to the dugout and telling J.R. Richard, who was one of the best pitchers in the game, that, that Dusty said he's going to hit a home run off him. Is there any truth to that story? It's true. True. He really, and he ends up hitting the home run. Yeah, and as wow. a matter of fact, that picture that you've seen that uh, uh, exemplifies the thirty home runs. We took that uh, we took that picture picture in advance. <laughs> oh wow! You thought oh, you made a jinx it? Yeah. What I mean, you know, and 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 of course, three of us were already there, and uh, I don't recall. Sorry about this. Uh, the um, photographer who was going to take the it could have been suhu but i'm just not sure i don't think he's been there that long uh testing me a little bit but uh yeah they said hey you know just so we get this out of the way you know so it's like hey this is going to happen so let's just go do this so we take the picture and now you know of all the people that you got to face on the last day of the season why is jr richard yeah, right. pitching right i mean why yeah. waste him for this game right uh other than if he might have been going for the 20th win or he needed another inning to win an earn run title or get a couple strikeouts or whatever, but he went the whole game. He pitched the whole game. And now, you know, you know, this is not the easiest guy to hit under any circumstances. But now when you're saying, you know, you've got, you've got Dusty Baker coming up, fortunately, he's going to get his last at bat in the last inning of the last game of the season. And you're facing this guy and, you know, Nice try, you know, well done. And he hits a home run. And, Amazing. you know, just absolutely a fairy tale after that. That's unbelievable. Yeah, and he hadn't had a lot of success against him in his career. And J.R. Richard, if you don't know, Mike Brito has once said that he, oh, rest in peace, the legend, he said that on when he had the gun, he was the highest velocity he's ever ever calculated. So, yeah, definitely not the easiest guy to go deep on, but he does it that day. And I just want to get your thoughts on Dusty Baker because, of course, the Astros, they went on to win the World Series. That's the last team the Dodgers won to see win the World Series. But what are your thoughts on your former teammate? How happy are you for his success? I'm happy for Dusty because he's had really a, tre a tremendous uh, 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 career as a manager in many places. And now for him to, you know, cap it off, not only as a player winning a world championship, now as a manager, he's got 2,000 wins. I think there's probably going to be a lot of consideration for him for the Hall of Fame as a manager. Yeah. And uh, it would be appropriate. You know, he's been really, really good. And he's a good guy. And he's stuck with it. And he's old school. And, you know, he's loyal. And, uh, you know, uh, he he deserves the best of that. As far as the Houston Astros are concerned, um, I'm, I'm not I, – I, I, congratulations. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, they didn't pay any penalty whatsoever for what they got involved in. Major League B Baseball gave them a pedestrian fine of $5 million. They fired the general manager and the manager. Those are the only two people that left. Uh, the players got to keep the rings, keep the money, uh, claim the championship. And uh, my opinion of that would have been uh, strip the title, Take away the uh, take away the rings. Uh, find the organization the take for the World Series, which was probably in the neighborhood of sixty five million dollars, and let the players keep the money for playing in the series, but vacate the title, and uh, you would have a difficult time, I think, 
trying to get money from the players because it would be a lawsuit against uh, or with the Players Association. That would have been a lost cause, I think. But I didn't think they served the penalty. The pandemic helped them not face the fans. Uh, they got away cheap. And uh, I, you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, but, yeah, they got away with it. Preach, Mr. Ron say. Preach, Thank Mr. Ron say. All right, we all agree with that take. And here, one thing I always point out, too, is I wish they had found out they were cheating earlier and were able to strip them of some of those draft picks because in the 2018 draft, they were able to get Jeremy Pena in the third round, who ends up winning the World Series MVP. So, yeah, we are not over it, Dodgers Nation. I don't think we ever will be. So, yeah, I love that fire, Mr. Say. Then moving right along, I want to ask you about just the Dodgers in the postseason. So, of course, as you mentioned earlier, always have a bullseye on the Dodgers back but then you add the fact that they set a new franchise record they win 111 games but they win just one postseason game they get bounced by the little brother Padres down there in San Diego and my question to you is this Dodger team a lot of people have said that it was because they weren't able to execute with runners in scoring position they weren't able to get those timely base hits they go five for 34 you yourself you were a postseason monster you won the Babe Ruth award that goes to the best player in the postseason 1981 you're one of three of your teammates to win the world series mvp what goes into being able to execute in the postseason is there a big difference between the regular season and the postseason when it comes to getting big hits <laughs> of course there is i mean these this is what you've been playing for the whole year i mean this is why you're doing what you're doing um it is different. The intensity rises. Uh, there are a number of things that you could uh, possibly put into the cookie jar and see what comes out. But, you know, they won the division handily. They had won the division earlier in the season, and it was not until the 1st of September be before it was confirmed. But you, they didn't have any uh, difficult games. There were no high-risk games going down the stretch. And if you remember, you know, the Mets and the, and the Atlanta were battling for that, that uh, title. Uh, the loser has to go and, and play a, th a three-game series with a wild-guard team, even though they're at home. Uh, the Padres and the Phillies had to battle down to the wire. And they got hot. And that's why they made it in. And, you know, now San Diego has to go to New York. And I really felt that in a short series, when you have to face DeGrom and Scherzer and you have a closer like Diaz, uh, that really, you're not going to score too many runs. And I would have thought that the rotation would have been DeGrom, Scherzer. I think that would have set a little bit different tone. You know, because then the, the uh, Scherzer got Scherzer got whacked, and now <laughs> they're relying on Jer De Degrom. He goes out and does what he does. But anybody that will tell you that's been in this situation before that any time you get to the last game of best of three, five, or seven, anything can happen. I don't care who you got out there; it can happen. And the fact that they didn't uh, uh, win that first game, they could have closed it out with DeGrom. They would have been really high, but they didn't. And Padres got hot, and they, they were able to take it. And then, of course, the Braves ran into a hot Philly team as well. And then the rest of it, you know, kind of just comes apart. The Dodgers did not execute. And you can say that they went in kind of, you know, ho-hum and they had some, you know, they had more time off than they probably needed. They needed to be sharp. They caught them on a low. But if you remember, the Dodgers came out of the shoot. They won the first game rather handily. Yeah. And then from that point on, they couldn't hit with runners in scoring position. And, uh, you know, they got outplayed. Simple as that. So in those situations, what is your approach? What is going through your mind when you do have to come up with a big hit in a big situation in the postseason versus the regular season? What are you looking for when you see this Dodger team's inability to do that? What do you think caused that? Uh, it could have just been a lack of confidence. You know, you, yeah. there's no guarantee that after you play 162 games and you go into the playoffs that you're on a high note. You know, individually, you hope that, you know, you're kind of, you know, I'm going to get a peak performance here uh, like they do in swimming and track and field. Well, in baseball, it's a little different. You know, they didn't play a significant game for, you know, months. Yeah. Right. And after a while, you know, I'm not saying that that 
uh, you weren't trying because they were still winning a lot of games, but the intensity level there. And when you increase the intensity level, when when you have been kind of walking through this, then it affects people different ways. They start, you know, grinding it, you know. And I thought they, they've really gotten to a position where they were really grinding. They were trying to find it, and they couldn't find it. Yeah, so you basically attribute that to a lot of that meaningless baseball. They were out in front. They won the division by so many games. And then you had that big layoff, and then you have to turn it on against a Padres team that has all that momentum. They want nothing more than to beat the Dodgers, and they did just that. But, yeah, I want to ask you also, because you guys in that 1981 run, you were facing multi-game deficits the entire postseason run, the Astros, the Expos, the Yankees, you were down 0-2. You basically had those juices flowing the entire time. But do you think there is something to be said about the postseason being a crapshoot? A lot of people say it's about who's the hottest team at the right time. But on the flip side, the Astros, they won 106 games. They were a team that had the layoff. They went on to win it. But what's your take on people saying that the postseason is a crapshoot? Well, um, first of all, you know, like I said, you know, anytime you get down to the best of, of, of the, you get to the last game of the best of the three, five or seven, you know, anything can happen. Uh, obviously, talent-wise, if you win 20 more games than somebody during the course of the regular season, you've got a lot more firepower. It didn't happen uh, for whatever reason. And you got to give a lot of credit to these people. You know, they yeah. fought back. And we, well, the Dodgers uh, did not uh, respond. And, uh, you know, I think they started to feel the pressure. And when you do... Uh, all of this can happen, but you know, I was kind of really surprised uh, too that we had so many players in the lineup. More, excuse me, the Dodgers had so many players in the lineup that were hovering around 200. Uh, you're basically relying on three people, maybe four, and uh, they've got to carry the weight. So, if the three top guys in the top of the lineup, and then you add Will Smith in the fourth spot, if they're not getting it done the bottom half of the lineup you're looking at three 200 hitters and you know it, uh, you know how, how do you expect to be able to do that i mean it's this game obviously is a different game because it's a strikeout home run game we strike out more than we get base hits in baseball now and it's happened four or five years in a row and i'm not sure about this year but i think it's fairly close but when you give away three innings a, day, a game uh, and then you rely on, you know, those guys uh, to pull you through and they don't get it done, then, you know, your opportunities are short and sweet, okay? And we don't play the game like you saw and grew up with if you were a fan years and years ago. Uh, there's no hitting and running. There's no bunting, even when you might think it might be a bunting. We took the DH uh, and put it into the National League, so there's less bunting now for the National League. And nobody bunts on their own. Uh, they might drop one down here or there, but not to say it's significant. And uh, we are a stationary game today. We go base to base. You know, there's not a lot of challenges going on. So, uh, you have bullpen games. You have guys re removed after five innings or throwing shutouts. Um, we all understand that this is the new way, but it's kind of hard to understand it from a, a, a purist's form of, of how you play the game because, I, you know, your, your guy's rolling along. He's under the pinch count, uh, hasn't walked anybody, hasn't given up any runs. Why do you turn it over? So those, these are questions that, you know, management can answer. And, you know, I'm just a, an observant former player. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There's really the three true outcomes in this day and age, and you're not seeing as much hitting for contact. Players aren't executing. When you just need a, a base hit with runners in scoring position, just put the ball in play, and they failed to do that too many times. But I did rewatch the entire 1981 World Series over the last week. I want to say that television quality has changed tremendously <laughs> since 1981, definitely. But I definitely watched the entire series, and I thought it was very interesting. So the second game, you guys lose, and yeah. you had lost six straight at Yankees stadium the you had so many struggles against that yankee team and then after that game when the reporters were trying to get in to the clubhouse and tommy lasorda didn't let them in and apparently had some choice words with you guys what can you tell me about what went on in that clubhouse after that game two lock between the players and the manager and did that spark the rest of the series 
Um, I don't. I don't think too many people really paid attention to Tommy's rant uh, <laughs> because it was similar to all the other ones that I'm sure you can imagine might have been said. Because we all already knew what was going on, and and uh, uh, we felt okay. We had time to regroup. We'd been down in every series in this. We're going to be okay. I remember getting on the bus at Yankee Stadium, going to the airport to come back to Los Angeles, and there were some wives there who had their heads down. They kind of didn't want to look at us when we came on the bus, and I said, look, ladies, uh, we're going to be back in New York next week so you can go shopping on uh, Fifth Avenue, okay? And so we go home, and we regroup, and we had some really tough games, but we fought back hard. Uh, We won three one-run games there. Uh, took it to the wire each time. Uh, Goose Gossage hit me in the head in game five in the bottom of the eighth inning and uh, suffered a concussion. And I had to stay behind. Uh, I had to do all the protocols. Uh, the good thing about that was it was on me. Uh, today's protocol would have boxed me for the rest of the series, and that would have hurt a lot worse than getting hit in the head by Goose Gossage. And so I'm off to New York once I've cleared myself. And uh, we had a one-day delay, which was very helpful. And uh, then we go out and play game six. And uh, Tom Lasorda is following me around like my shadow dog, asking me, you going to be okay? Can you play? Uh, You know, here's the lineup. Uh, The fourth spot's open. Uh, It's for you. And, uh, you know, I'm laughing, of course. And I said, look, I know what's, I know what's where I'm hitting and I'm going to let you know if you would just leave me alone a little bit and let me figure this out. And I hadn't even taken batting practice yet. And I had a new helmet that I had to have a flap on because I didn't have the flap. And so I was very fortunate to get away. Uh, I came within uh, half an inch or less of, you know, having serious damage. And fortunately enough, it was nothing but a concussion. So I played. We won. I got the game-winning hit. I got two hits. Uh, we, we, I come out of the game in the, I think, the fifth or sixth inning because I got a little dizzy running the bases. Uh, when Baker hit a, a single to right field, I went to third, and a Guerrero hit a triple to the gap. And uh, then I went out that half inning and caught the last out of the inning on a little humpback liner. It came at me like a fuzzy tennis ball. Wow. And so I said, you know, I went into Tommy. I said, look, uh, you you need to, I I need to step aside here. I I don't want anything bad happening on my watch. Worst case scenario, I can play tomorrow. But, you know, we were up. We ended up winning that game 9-2. to And, you know, Steve Howe got Bob Watson to hit a fly ball to Kenny Lander on center field. And we're bringing the World Series championship back to Los Angeles. But, yeah, I want to talk about that game, too, as well. I mean, you talk about what you did in game three. You get the home run off of Rigetti, that three-run home run. And then later in the game, you catch that bunt in foul territory. You're laying out. You make that diving catch. What do you think was the turning point in that series? Well, the turning point really was in the first inning, too. You know, we hadn't had a big hit uh, pretty much throughout up to that point uh, for the first two games. And, you know, we had a golden opportunity. We had runners at first and third with nobody out. Uh, I, uh, Baker popped up in foul ground. Garvey struck out. And then, you know, I took uh, Rigetti deep into the count. And uh, the pitch before I hit out, uh, I hit a breaking ball, wrapped it around the foul pole. And so now I came back next pitch and, you know, do it for good, fair. Uh, I'd done that a couple of times, hit one foul and then hit one fair. Not many times, but this one was good. So it gave us a little bit of a cushion. And then, of course, Fernando had a gutsy performance. It was not a, it was not a well-pitched game for him. He walked seven guys, gave up four runs, uh, but he was gutsy. And he ended up, you know, uh, fulfilling, uh, you know, a, that uh, that victory for us, and and uh, you know we were able to get out of there five to four. But that one inning that he had, where I made the play, you know this stopped the inning, stopped the bleeding here. This was their last chance that they would have, and of course we doubled up the runner, and then uh, we get out of the inning, so we uh, escaped, uh, you know, damage. 
Yeah, it almost reminded me of the double play with Justin Turner back in 2020 where he's like Superman laying out. You get that double play there. It's such a big play. You mentioned Fernando Valenzuela, a gutsy performance. He was dealing with traffic all night long. But you go on to win that World Series, and it's not any World Series. It's against this New York Yankees team that had your number. Was it that much more special because it was against the pinstripes? Absolutely. You know, we should have won in 78. You know, we had an interference call that changed yeah. the whole complexion of the series after being ahead 2-1, and then this game actually changed it to a point where they ended up coming back in extra innings and winning. But if the proper call, if we would have had replay on it, we would have been up three games to one, and I think we would have pretty much taken care of business. That one got away. That's my biggest disappointment uh, in my career, not being able to, you know, withstand that a little bit better and fight back. Uh, but beating the Yankees, the, the, the number one history and tradition in all of, uh, uh professional baseball, um, you know, we could live another hundred years and nobody's going to catch the Yankees with what they've accomplished. But, uh, we have a history and tradition that is second to none uh, in the National League. Uh, I do uh, have a great deal of respect for the St. Louis Cardinal organization. I think they're right there with us. But uh, needless to say, we have one of uh, the, the greatest history and traditions in, in all of baseball, and we're very proud of being able to add something to that. Absolutely. And yeah, just asking about that uh, Reggie Jackson play, the hip check on the Bill Russell throw. Have you ever asked him about that in person? Have you guys ever of talked course. about it? What does he say? I like the replay what argument. Happened? I like the replay what, argument. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> you just act like it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, and then, of course, you see the replays and you see him obviously sticking out his hip. Clearly. Which Yankee fan says, well, it wasn't much, uh, but it doesn't take much. You know, that's why they have, you know, interference calls and, and football and stuff. It doesn't make you. You hold on to somebody's face back. That's a, that's a penalty, okay? It really is. And uh, the fact that, you know, he was able to get, it, get away with it, uh, you know, was unfortunate because back then the umpires – usually liked to stay out of the way of the person who made the call, right? They didn't huddle together, although they did huddle together, but they still allowed the player, the, the umpire who made the call to put it in order. And he didn't change his mind. And now if you, you see it, uh, you know, if they would have just said, hey, look, Frank, Frank Bully, uh, you know, this, 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 is, th th this actually happened. He did get in the way. You know, and he's down the right field line, so he can't see the side view. But the second base umpire probably would have had a better view, right? Yeah. He's straight on or straight across, you know, so he didn't uh, overrule him. So that's, we had to live with that, but it, it hurt. Sorry, I got the last laugh in 1981, right? Well, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I'm, I, it didn't matter. Honestly, it didn't matter as long as we won, but it certainly feels better when you can say the New York Yankees. Yeah, for sure. And then I want to talk to you about... Your time with the Cubs. So you get traded after the 1982 season, I believe sometime early in 1983. And you're starting to see them break up that infield. I think Davy Lopes was the first to get traded. And then Steve Garvey goes to San Diego. Well, this offseason, you have Justin Turner, who they declined his option. And they're talking about wanting to bring him back. What do you think he's going through right now? Another guy who's an iconic Dodger that might be playing with another team. Towards the end of your career, kind of what is the plan in those situations? Uh, you know, uh, once again, I, 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 I see it as, uh, uh, as nothing more than, you know, salary slashing. Yeah. Uh, they're going to do, they did it to Kershaw. Uh, you know, they did it two years in a row. Um, they're offering him a lot more money though. Uh, what they're offering Kershaw is more than what Turner would make, but I can definitely see it. He's got a $2 million buyout as, as I'm understanding it. Um, I would think that, uh, he can, if he wants to come back, he's got a lot of things going on here for himself. He's done a terrific job for us in the community, uh, meaning the Dodgers. And uh, I, I don't know. He would have a better understanding of that. But I would, I would say if, if he's able to make half of what he made last year, um, it, it's up to him to make that decision of whether it's worth it or not. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then you're also the first player ever to go to arbitration with the Dodgers. You know, it was a brand new world back then. We had just signed a new basic agreement that had arbitration and free agency and a lot of other stuff in there. So it was new, uh, new territory. And uh, I had a 
decision to make about, uh, you know, we couldn't come to an agreement and uh, arbitration was available. And that way uh, you submit your bids. The closest one to that number is going to win. And uh, I had spoken with Al Campanis and he uh, uh, told me that he uh, couldn't pay me uh, what I was asking for. So we had to go to arbitration. And I had gotten some feedback from some of the players that I was with. Uh, and they said, you really want to do this. This is going to upset them. And I'm saying, listen, uh, I have told the club the same thing. I said, I am trying to resolve this problem. I don't want to be a holdout. I want to go to spring training on time. I want to be there. Uh, this way, it'll be what I'm asking for, what you're, what you're ready to settle with. And we did. And uh, so I get a call a couple days before we are scheduled to go to Vero Beach on the KO2 plane. And we were going to KTTV luncheon. And uh, just so happens that Peter and Walter were at the luncheon. And I had gotten word that I had won my arbitration case. And uh, now, um, ironically, uh, <laughs> we're leaving the event at the same time. And uh, Peter and I and Walter are walking out together. And Peter takes uh, a, a side venture and says, Dad, I'm going to go get the car. Uh, I'll meet you right back here. And so Walter, in his advanced stage of throat cancer with his froggy voice, is telling me how much he uh, 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 is, how very proud of me he is uh, by standing for my guns and all of this and whatever. And he's very proud of me and so on. And he says uh, to me, he says, uh, just don't ever do this again. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I smiled and laughed and I, I took it both ways as he meant it and that was you know the actually the the start of a very long relationship that I've had and I've been close with ownership especially Peter Walter passed away in 1979 and Walter took uh, Peter took over and uh, Peter is the one who came and asked me back in 1996 to come back and work for the club. And he pretty much left me with, uh, you know, carte blanche. You know, you've, you're going to def be defining a new position here. So I had fun putting that together. It lasted 26 years. I'm no longer an employee there. And so I'm uh, venturing out with some other things. And one of the things is podcast, just like we're doing here. And uh, also have a, uh, a book that's going to be coming out. Next uh, spring, I hope, I'm hopeful for. Uh, we don't have a title for it yet, but uh, those are the things that I'm working on right now. Yeah, so talk about your new podcast. We'll see about that, how much fun you're having. What made you want to get into it? I had a friend of mine uh, that I had run into uh, that had been in radio for 30 years or plus, and uh, uh, also a friend of mine, uh, Fraser Smith, who used to uh, do some radio back in the late 70s, and they both kind of, uh, in a particular mail, uh, said, you know, you'd be kind of a natural doing these podcasts. Uh, I'm not sure I'm a, uh, one of those naturals yet, but uh, we've done a couple. Uh, I feel comfortable with it now. Uh, it's something that he talked me into. Uh, and, you know, uh, as things were going, I said, you know, this is, uh, you know, maybe something I should look into. Maybe I should just uh, take a little more time and think about it. And I did. And it just so happened that uh, that happened uh, a year ago, February, and it's taken us a long time to get in that position. Uh, also, the book started uh, that way as well, but my uh, beat, my uh, ghostwriter unfortunately came down with cancer, and so I had 20 hours of Zoom uh, because of the pandemic in the can, and we pretty much had to start over, so I had to box oh. it. So it's taken a long time, gone full circle. Uh, it's been frustrating at times, but um, kind of goes with the territory. But I branched out. Um, I, I felt like it was time to open up. You know, I'm 74 now. Um, uh, all you have to do is Google me to find out a whole lot of stuff. And I kind of felt in the past like they know enough about me. But there were enough people who came forward and convinced me that uh, the, you might enjoy this. There might be a lot of people out there who want to hear what you have to say. So that's, that's the road I'm uh, taking at this point in time, and we'll see how it goes. 
Yeah, and it's a great podcast. I recommend all of our viewers to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Essential listening for Dodger fans, baseball fans out there. It's a great listen. Definitely highly recommend it. And Ron, we appreciate you so much for joining us here today. I can't thank you enough. Had so much fun doing this and uh, go Dodgers. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here and I hope you have a great show as well. 